It's such an honor to be here. Uh, I, I want to first thank, of course, Governor Bush and Patricia Levesque for the great honor of, of moderating this panel. I uh, hope, hope it's very informative to you. Uh, as Lowell mentioned, I, I am the chairman of a group called Step Up for Students, which um, administers the Florida Tax Credit Scholarship Program, which is a program for low-income children in the state. We'll talk about its design a little bit later. But it now has 50,000 children on the program. It's about 10 years old. We're very proud of that. We, probably, we think it'll probably be at about 100,000 kids in about three years. Uh, it is the largest school choice program in the country and will continue to be. Our panelists today are a very distinguished group. Uh, I'm very honored to have them here with me today. Uh, first, we have Senator Conrad Appel from Louisiana. He is the chairman of the uh, Senate Education Committee, and he's going to talk to us about the incredible uh, gains that, that they've made in Louisiana, particularly the new voucher program which uh, I was proud to be a part of as uh, a board member of the American Federation for Children. And by the way, if, uh, if you have a chance, I hope you can meet uh, Betsy DeVos is here, our chair, and our most recent chair, Bill Obendorf, he's here. Uh, there also, I should have mentioned, there are also some great staff members from Step Up for Students. Um, I hope you can meet them as well. Uh, we also have Delegate Algie Howell from Virginia. Virginia just passed a tax credit program in the most recent session. And uh, Delegate Howell was an integral part of, of that effort, and I really am very, very much looking forward to hearing his perspective on the, the challenges that there are trying to, to gain bipartisan support for these, for these measures. Uh, we have uh, Jason Nelson, and he actually led the, the successful effort in Oklahoma to pass the Lindsay Nicole Henry Scholarship Program. This is a, a scholarship program or voucher program for children with special needs, and he's going to give us uh, his insights from, from that effort and also the court battle that they're currently in. Uh, and last but certainly not least, we have the Speaker of the House in New Hampshire, uh, William L. O'Brien. And you may have read that they also passed a new tax credit scholarship program, uh, which was, uh, they had to deal with a veto uh, effort from their, uh, from their governor. So that should be an interesting uh, discussion to hear from the Speaker. So thank you all for being here today. I was asked to give uh, just a few minutes, I'm going to time myself so I don't take too much time because I want to hear from our, our panelists, to, to frame the discussion this morning. Uh, the reason this panel is so important, I think, is that as you heard Governor Bush say so eloquently, choice is a catalyst for all the other elements in the Bush reform package. They're all important. One's not more important than the other, but I, I personally believe that, that choice is a catalyst that makes all the other ones work better and faster. And if we're going to be for choice, are we going to be for all forms of choice? I know there, there are people, maybe even in, the, in this room, or certainly at this conference, who say, yeah, I, I'm for parental choice, but I'm just for charters. I, I, I'm not for private school choice. I don't want to go all, all the way and empower parents in that manner. I personally think that's a mistake. Why? Well, first, I object to that stance on, on moral grounds. I think that we're now moving to a new definition of public education where you have taxpayer dollars going to new providers, whether it be charter operators or virtual operators, or, or even new delivery methods over the internet, content over the internet, as you heard the governor say. When we're moving to this new definition, why are we going to take off the table one of the most effective del delivery methods for low-income kids? private schools in low-income areas. You would be stunned, as I was when I got into this movement, how many private schools there are in low-income areas. It's, it's very surprising. And I, I always try to take people to a place in my home state, Jacksonville, Florida. It's a big district. It's about uh, 140,000 kids. And like some districts, um, it's not a friendly district for charters. In Florida, we don't have alternative authorizers, so we're, we're dependent upon the districts for charters. And there aren't many in Jacksonville. Uh, a couple years ago, there were only like 10 or 12, and, and those didn't even really serve low-income kids. They were, most of them were in uh, higher-income areas. Well, listen to this. There are 100, over, over 100 private schools serving low-income kids on the tax credit scholarship program in Florida. Over 100 private schools. Now, why would we take those schools off the menu for low-income parents in Jacksonville. And let me make it more specific. Imagine you are a low-income single mom in Jacksonville. 
and you've got a seventh grade boy who is going the wrong way. And there's a school on your street, and this is not theoretical, school on your street, there's one in Jacksonville, one of my favorites, K through 12 school. They have a 99% graduation rate and 90% of the kids go on to college or the military. Why should she not be able to send her kid to that school? Are you willing to go to her and say, well, I, I'm for charter only. I'm not for full choice. So you need to wait until we bring a high quality charter school to your neighborhood. You know what she's going to tell you? Of course she's going to say to you, I don't have time to wait. My son will be lost by that time. Again, I just think it's morally wrong. The second reason charter only is not a good strategy is that the competition effect that Governor Bush talked about this morning is much more robust if you have more schools in the mix, including private schools. And this has been proven by research in Florida. Under Governor Bush's A-plus program, you had the, the most rapid improvement by public schools just by the threat, not even actual, but the mere threat of competition from private school choice. That was proven by research. And I'm proud to say that the tax credit scholarship program, a study has been done by Northwestern University that shows that the more a public school has participation in this program, the tax credit program, the more kids that leave, the bigger the learning gains at that public school. The bigger the learning gains for the kids that remain. So again, the more schools in the mix, the more competitive effect, the better the improvements for the public schools. Third reason that charter only, I think, is a mistake. You leave on the table political assets that can be used in the reform battle. What do I mean by that? Well, the private school choice measures can give you a large number of kids in the seats in the first one or two years. In Florida, we had 15,000 kids in the tax credit pro program in the first year, 15,000. That enabled us to go and organize the parents of those kids and use those parents as a political force. And Michael Benjamin's here, our, our grassroots organizer. I urge you to talk to him about how we did this. And we used those parents to work on Democratic legislators who were from those minority districts. We also discovered that a lot of the schools in these low-income areas were affiliated with churches that were run by ministers who were absolutely kingmakers in Democratic politics in these districts. So we worked with those ministers. And does it work? It's not theoretical. It works. In 2001, when the law was passed, and Speaker Feeney's here, he was there when we passed it, we could only get one Democrat in the whole legislature to vote for the bill. And he was, a, he was an accident, he was a, he was a mistake. Uh, he was a retiring uh, trial lawyer who had gone to Catholic school as a kid and said, yeah, I'm gonna do the right thing since I'm retiring. We couldn't get a single member of the Black Caucus to vote for the bill, not one. Seven years later, after this work with the parents and the ministers, majority of the Black Caucus voted for this program. That's a sea change. Half the Democrats in the House voted for this program. Huge difference. Third of them in the Senate, including the Senate Majority Leader, an African American senator. So again, charter only strategy, you leave those assets on the table, in, in my opinion. When do, you, when do you do vouchers? When do you do tax credits? My own personal preference is if you can do vouchers, do them. Why? Well, then you don't, you don't have to raise all the money every year. That's a gargantuan task. Uh, you can't always do vouchers. And I, I see my friend Daniel in the audience, uh, former general counsel to Governor Bush, all these friends here, it's wonderful. I'm not used to such a friendly audience. I usually go and try to convince unfriendly audiences this is a great idea. But uh, <clears throat> you know, some, some states have Blaine am amendments, which I'm sure you all are familiar with. They're, they're basically state constitutional measures to separate church and state that are more stringent than the federal constitution. These amendments and other measures are used by activist courts to strike down voucher laws. Tax credit bills are much more safe constitutionally, and sometimes you, just, you have to go that route. The other reason you might want to go with a tax credit program, this is silly, but it's true, and I, I'm I'll be interested to get the opinion of our legislators. Some legislators are more comfortable voting for tax credits rather than vouchers, even though the end result is the same. It's competition and empowerment for parents. They just are more comfortable. That's just the way it is. So sometimes the legislative path is easier with tax credits. Uh, and then finally, and I don't really think this should be the driving issue, but private schools tend to be more comfortable with tax credit programs because they perceive that there'll be less government interference uh, in, their, in their operations. What I'll leave you with is I'll set the table of some of the issues that you're gonna have to think about as you pass or try to pass voucher or tax credit legislation. 
for both voucher programs and tax credit programs, you're going to have to decide who is eligible. Will it be a means-tested program? Uh, will it be based on a failing schools model? Uh, one advice, word of advice I would give you is if, if you're not going to means-test the program, don't sell it like it, it's a social justice issue because that will come back and bite you later on. Are you going to have a cap on the program? A lot of the tax credit programs have caps, although I wish they didn't. Uh, sometimes you'll see people try to sunset the programs. Please try to avoid that if you can, at all, if at all possible. What kind of academic accountability are you going to have for the programs? Are you going to require state tests or nationally norm reference tests or no tests? Uh, what will be the reporting for those test results? Will the public get to see them? To what level? At a state level? On a school level? Important questions to ask. Uh, and by the way, I have great admiration for John White. He's here today, the, the superintendent of Louisiana, uh, and the structures that he has come up with to, to administer the Louisiana per program. If you have a chance to meet and talk with him about that, you should do so. And finally, on the tax credit side, there are some unique issues that you'll have to, to deal with. Uh, will you allow scholarship organizations just to serve one school? I personally don't like that, and that's a controversial position, but I, I would like to see parents empowered, so I like to see the scholarships portable to any qualified school. I don't think it should be a contest between schools to see who can raise the most money. I think these programs are designed to empower parents. Um, how much of, a, of an administrative cost allowance are you going to allow for the scholarship organizations? The highest you see in the country is 20% of the money you raise in Pennsylvania. That's why there's 200, over 200 scholarship organizations. The lowest is in Florida. We have 3% and there's one. So you can see the spectrum there. Uh, religious discrimination, are you, are you going to allow a, a scholarship organization just to serve kids of one religion? That's constitutional, but is it a good idea? Uh, maybe it's not so bad in the public's mind to have a Catholic only scholarship program, but can the public handle a Muslim only scholarship program? It's something you need to think about. And finally, and very importantly, you've got to have very strong fiscal accountability for the scholarship organizations that actually administer this program. If you don't, I guarantee you, you will have front page stories that will damage the, the program's credibility. And I have 15 seconds left, and I'm going to give that up and uh, move to our first panelist, uh, Senator Appel from Louisiana, and he's going to talk to us about the fantastic victory that they had uh, in Louisiana. Senator. Thank you. Good morning. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, let me start out by saying that um, five years ago, Louisiana was the bottom as far as the United States in educational outcomes. And it had been the bottom for as long as anyone ever could remember. Uh, we were dominated by a good old boy system of school boards and legislators and unions. And uh, no one really gave a hoot about the kids. It wasn't, they were just a, something that came along with the ride. Uh, we had a sea change. We elected a new governor, and through term limits, we changed a large majority of our uh, legislature. And that body together, working together, the governor's office and the legislature, uh, rejected it. We said, no, we're tired of it. It's not going to happen anymore. So we started probably four years ago passing elements uh, of a massive educational reform package. Um, you heard this morning Governor Bush uh, outlined five elements that he considered most important. We have now put in place all five elements, every one of them. It's going to take a generation to find out if it really works. And it's going to take diligence and hard work to be sure that the uh, forces of the status quo, as we like to call them, don't pick us to pieces and take it apart a little at a time so that we end up back in the same boat that we were in just four years ago. I'm going to just concentrate on one element, which is the, um, what we call a scholarship program. It's better known as vouchers. Um, let me skip a couple of this. And I'm going to go pretty quickly, and I do apologize. We only have a limited amount of time. Um, our our um, scholarship program, our voucher program, has four major elements. Uh, the first one is the one that's most commonly known in the United States. It's a true voucher, and I'll dis uh, discuss that in a moment. The second one, uh, the scholarship donation rebates are the ones that John was just talking about. That's uh, where businesses can make uh, contributions and those can be funneled to the kids. Um, we have one for students with exceptionalities and then we have course choice, which is distance learning, whatever you want to call it, virtual classrooms, that sort of thing. So we have four elements uh, of our um, voucher program. The first element is the traditional one that we, that we know most about. 
Um, we started about three years ago, four years ago, with a test case in Orleans Parish. A parish in Louisiana is a county in every other state. We're always a little bit different than everyone else. Um, Orleans Parish is New Orleans. It's the city of New Orleans. And after Hurricane Katrina, the entire educational structure, by the way, the, the educational structure of the city of New Orleans was the most corrupt and least effective of any in the United States. The kids that came out of there didn't even get that piece of paper. I mean, they got a piece of paper, but it was less than worthless. Uh, Hurricane Katrina was a huge disaster, but gave us the greatest opportunity of many lifetimes. We literally disassembled the entire educational structure of New Orleans and restructured it uh, in a new model, uh, pr principally based upon uh, charter schools. It's almost entirely charter schools. Uh, but we did have a test case, mainly working with the Catholic Church, to do vouchers. And we had about 1,800 kids, and it, it had, I will be honest with you, had somewhat mixed results. Uh, we learned from our lessons, and this last year we passed uh, the bill, uh, which I'm going to talk about right now, called Louisiana Scholarship Program, uh, with these elements. Number one, only kids uh, below 250% of the federal poverty line are eligible, which is in Louisiana 57,000 for a family of four, 38,000 for a single, uh, fam single parent family. Uh, kids uh, can enter through, if they're entering kindergarten, or if they're enrolled in a C, D, or F school. And you heard the governor talking about uh, letter grades. We instituted letter grades three years ago, I believe. Uh, and it has truly been a sea change. It's amazing. Before, we had a convoluted system of stars and arrows. A rocket scientist couldn't understand it. And it was done that way on purpose, believe me. Um, and then the other part of it in Louisiana, they used a 200-point grading scale. It was amazing. You know, the school boards would proudly say, oh, look, we, our schools rate 86% out of 200. That's 43%. Nobody would get that because they covered it up with stars and arrows and things. Now we have ABC, so we know, we know what's going on. Um, to be eligible, a school to participate must either be an A or a B rated public school or private schools which have been approved by our Board of Education. This year, the first year of applications, we had 10,000. Now remember, we had 1,800 in the trial case uh, going on, but we had an additional 10,000, or total of 10,000 students apply. Uh, we only had slots for 4,944, which were filled, um, which was a growth. The, the slide, I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong slide, I apologize. The, the uh, growth then was 3,000 kids over the number prior, uh, previously. 91% of those are minority kids. I'm going to talk about how important that is in a second. Um, uh, these school, th just for curiosity, they came out of schools. 14% came from C-rated schools, 69% from D, and 17% from F-rated schools. Uh, the participating school structure, one is a public school. Remember, it could be an A or B-rated public school. Uh, but 117 are private schools, and one of the elements uh, that we were attacked on was that, oh, we're just creating a method under which people can st just steal money from the state by creating a school out of nowhere and sucking these kids in, taking all the money and running off and buying Cadillacs. Um, what we found was 86% of these schools that took these kids have been in business more than 10 years, 73% had been more than 25 years, and 47% more than 50 years. So we did not see a case where suddenly there were a whole flock of new schools jumping up to just get, grab the money and run, if you will. Um, the way the thing works is um, we have a basic funding structure in Louisiana called the Minimum Foundation Program. It equates to about $8,300 per year per kid, it varies by different parishes and so forth, but that's the average. Um, they can get up to that amount of money. Actually, the slide says 8,500. I think it's 8,300. Um, what we have found is that because parochial and private schools tuitions are generally lower than that, the average cost to the state is only $5,300 per kid. So we're saving the state of Louisiana $3,200 per kid uh, and, and sending them to far better schools. Um, the next element, and I'm going to run through this really briefly because I'm sure I'm already out of my time, um, is the, uh, the business tax credit deal. It has the same, same elements of eligibility and for schools and students as the traditional voucher program. 
And what this does is it allows a business to make a contribution to the state. Um, and, and from that contribution, a, up to 80% can go to middle and elementary school kids. 90% goes to a voucher for public high school kids. The balance goes to basically the school district for operations and overhead, if you will. Uh, the the uh, privately funded donations are tax deductible in the year following the scholarship award. Um, then we have a, a, another program, very briefly again, and I apologize, uh, for special education kids. Uh, it requires that there be a uh, individual education plan. They must be eligible under disability, with an eligible disability under the law and live in one of six participating parishes. It's a, it, this is a trial case. Uh, we have uh, 64 parishes in Louisiana, so we're opening this up to six right now, about 10%. Uh, the tuition is available is about $3,000 per kid uh, with exceptionalities. Uh, the last element is, is course choice. This is the online learning uh, program. This is what Governor Bush was talking about earlier about uh, uh, embracing technology. Um, we have had in Louisiana, we actually have two excellent programs that have been in existence for many years, but we're opening up the entire uh, public education system to outside providers. Now they have to meet certain requirements, they have to be uh, vetted by our Board of Education, they have to have the type of programs that fit the needs that we have, but they can be from various different uh, originators. They could be from traditional universities, for instance. They can be from school systems. We actually have some of our school systems that prepare online learning courses and they can be sold to the state and then distributed to other systems. They can be from uh, business organizations. The Associated Builders and Contractors, for instance, are doing some on technological areas. So it's, it's opened up to this broad spectrum. Uh, I will tell you it's an experiment like all of these things. Um, we don't really know where we're going. We're feeling our way through it, but we have great, great feelings of positive nature that what's going to come of this will be the wave of the future and will allow our children to go on. I mean, in particular, we, if you take a rural uh, school district that doesn't have the resources for, say, a special calculus teacher, uh, that a child in that rural district would be given the opportunity to take an advanced placement course, for instance, something to that effect. So I guess, am I out of time? I'm pretty much. I'm pretty much out of time, so I'm going to do it. Plenty of time in, plenty of time in Q&A. Sorry. I, I love these things. It <laughs> takes me about an hour and a half to do this normally, so uh, I do appreciate the opportunity to be here, and I will be very uh, interested in hearing the questions, and I'll uh, turn it over to my next uh, neighbor. I hope, hope we all appreciate just how monumental what they've done in Louisiana. And, and this is pretty much in one session, correct? I mean, let's give them a hand. Yeah, I, uh, my, as the governor pointed out about the posterior, my posterior is about one half the size. Of uh, but um, our next delegate, uh, I, I want to take a point of privilege and just say personally how much respect I have for him. I, I followed his journey very closely. We supported him in, his, in a couple of his races, but I, I watched him as he was pretty much one of the only people in his caucus who stood up and, and in my opinion, did the right thing and supported uh, that this, the bill he's going to talk about. And, and I know for him that was a very lonely place to be. And so, I, Delegate Howe, I just have tremendous respect for you. And um, perhaps you can give us some perspective on what you heard in the Democratic caucus room, the, the, the objections, how you tried to overcome those objections. And, and uh, just very, very happy to have you here. And I, every state is different. And you got to understand that you know, Virginia is one of the states where private schools and, and, and the creation of them doesn't have a real positive um, history. So, uh, Delegate Held, take it away. Well, I'm honored to uh, be here this morning, and I do not feel out of place by being uh, in the minority because <laughs> I've seemingly been in the minority all of my life. How many of you were around here in, uh, I think it was May the 17th, 1954? How many of you were in the state then? How many people here, and you don't have to if you don't want to, uh, raise your hand if you're 74 or older? <laughs> Great. That means I'm the only, old, oldest person in the house. <laughs> uh, Virginia has a strange history in the sense that uh, you remember that decision that I just mentioned a few minutes ago that was handed down May the 17th, 19th. 
54 Brown versus the Board of Education, which declared Plessy versus Ferguson, uh, you know, unconstitutional wrong, and we had the Brown versus the Board of Education. In my state, the state of Virginia, which I'm very proud of and uh, its uh, tradition and heritage, uh, we, and when I say we, see, I feel like I'm a part of this state, of the state of Virginia. I forget we are across the Potomac here in Washington now. I feel, like, I feel like that I'm a part of the state. So whatever happens in the state, whatever happens in the House of Delegates, uh, since I'm a member there, uh, I feel somewhat responsible for it. It was not easy uh, getting this uh, tax credit uh, bill through. Uh, we had to try during two sessions. Uh, I have the votes here in front of me. Uh, I was the only uh, minority, black, if you might put it that way, that voted uh, for it. Uh, all of the other uh, blacks in the House of Delegates voted against uh, the bill. Uh, I did not um, get any particular repercussions from the other black members because I voted for it because I have been somewhat of a lone ranger ever since I've been there. I take positions that some others maybe because of their uh, will to go higher, you know, they're afraid to take take chances. Uh, the bill was, was uh, overwhelmingly supported by the uh, Republican uh, side of the House. Had that not been the case, of course, uh, it would not have passed. But as I was looking through uh, the list of names here of the people that uh, voted against it, uh, it's difficult for me to understand uh, as a black and why that some other blacks would vote against something that they do just the opposite. One, one person here, I will not call his name, but he owns a big business. He has a thriving business in the state of Virginia, and he has school aged children. Uh, he sends his children to a private school because he can afford it. Now, when I left Richmond last week and drove back to Norfolk, I stopped at a little place there called uh, Paula's Chicken. I noticed two young black women sitting over to my right, close enough that I could have touched them if I'd wanted. They had a small child there who looked to be less than two years old. They were eating uh, fried gizzards, livers, whatever they were. And this child, this less than two years old, was eating french fries. Now that was his lunch. Undoubtedly, for dinner that night, he probably would get a McDonald or Burger King. At an age when his brain are developing, they're developing, he needs to have good food. The, this is what we, the problem that we have with a lot of young parents who cannot afford to send their children to uh, private schools. Uh, as a former teacher myself, uh, I recall back in the 60s, I would re request the so-called slow learners in my class because I believe every child can learn if he or she has the opportunity. As the governor pointed out this morning, everybody's not a genius. Some people are smarter than others, but everybody deserves the opportunity to have the chance. And I think with this tax credit, those children will have the opportunity or the chance at least to try in life. Last year during the General Assembly, uh, someone brought about 75 or 100, and, and I would say that 99% of these kids were black to the General Assembly to visit with us. These were kids that were in favor of this, their parents were in favor of it. not the kind that has a lot of money. But under this program, the donations that are made, 90% of those funds has to go towards children that's in that category. So it's not a handout for anyone, it's something to make sure that children who do not have, their parents are not in the same economical standing as someone else, that they can maybe survive in life. Now, my uh, daughter, bless her heart, who is in Indiana now, she has two children, one 16 and the other one is 11. It just so happens that they are the only two black children in the school division there or in the school that they attend. Because of the background that they received at St. Patrick Catholic School in Norfolk, which was very expensive for her to send them to, it's a private school, but they were prepared to meet with that diverse group of people when they were there. And my oldest daughter, who is a uh, granddaughter, who is 16, there's 85 students in that class, and she has the third highest 
GPA in the class. It did not happen by means of osmosis. It was preparation that her mother and father was able to do prior to going there. The same thing with the other one. Now, I want every child in America to have that opportunity. That is why I strongly support school choice. As we walk down Pennsylvania Avenue here, now, our president, no disrespect, I love him, I voted for him. His children, they do not go to the public school. They go to a private school. Why? Because he knows and Michelle knows that that's best for their children. Okay? So why every other parent in this country cannot have the same opportunity? This is what uh, Governor Bush was trying to say to us this morning, and it, it was clear to me. But I have a difficult job of selling this to people, especially minorities, who have been, to some degree, brainwashed by unions and other people because they are saying, well, this is taking money away from the public school. Well, when my daughter paid for private lessons for her children, she was still paying taxes for other children to go to school. So it seems a little, uh, a little unfair. So uh, how many more minutes do I have? <laughs> Three minutes. Good. I want to continue then. <laughs> when I went to uh, Hampton High School, and y you pretty well understand what I'm saying about the tax credit, don't you? <clears throat> it's for people who can, these are people that they have money, they can afford to give money to help underprivileged children uh, or poor children. Uh, when I went to uh, Hampton High School in 1967 as the first uh, black to teach uh, social studies there, I was greeted with these words by the principal that morning. He said, well, I guess you know I didn't hire you. Now, I understood that because the, one of the board members who was a member of the board in Hampton talked to me in the barber shop when I was getting ready to graduate and asked me, you know, how would I like to go to Hampton to teach? I said, only if I can go to the all-white school. Well, I, I was on a mission. I had a plan. I wanted to make sure that I was, played an integral part with those kids because I had worked with Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. in the Civil Rights Movement, and I understood the need for that. Now, you might, you know, if, if, if you didn't, had, had I not had the background that I did, I would have misunderstood what the principal said when he said, I guess you know I didn't hire you. Well, I knew that. Who would like to have someone come and work for them that they did not interview? No one. He did not have the opportunity to interview me because the superintendent hired me directly. I understood that. But we ended up being the best of friends as a result of that. We worked through the program there, and, and, and I would like to think that we did a, a, a good job. As a matter of fact, one of the students that I taught there, uh, World Geography, <coughs> uh, she <coughs> retired some 30 but with 36 years of service at Norfolk State University, and she is currently working as my legislative assistant. Matter of fact, she's sitting back there in this room now. She, she's here with us. So, you know, that's the kind of thing I think that we have to do. Uh, when they would turn in a paper to me, you know, I would mark it up if there was a misspelled word. You couldn't get away with anything in the class. This is what we are not, and that's what the governor was saying this morning. We have to make sure that the teachers that we have in the classroom properly prepare our students for, for higher learning. Thank you. Thank you. If, if all the legislators that, that I personally deal with have your courage and your integrity, well, my job would be a heck of a lot easier, but they don't. Next, this, this speaker from New Hampshire. Tell us about your battle, particularly your, your, your veto threat, and uh, how you overcame that. I'm very, very interested to hear. Well, John, I'm, I'm honored to be here today, and, and uh, I'm really overwhelmed with the... Did you turn the mic on? You hear it now? As I said, I'm, I'm really honored to be here today, and, and uh, I'm truly overwhelmed by the perspective and courage of Delegate Howell. Thank you for that. Um, as in many states, New Hampshire's education results over time have been uneven and declining, and this is despite increasing spending. You know, I can give you one personal example. I began my public service on the school board in, in my town, and I uh, left the school board about eight years ago. Over that eight-year period, the school population in my town has gone down approaching 25 percent, and yet the spending has gone up in that eight-year period 
by 220 percent. And, and yet the results are declining. It, it, the, the school is becoming less successful than it has been over time. And so as in many states, New Hampshire's implemented a, a number of uh, expanded educational options, um, include charter schools and online learning, educational savings accounts, and strengthened homeschooling choices. The homeschooling community in New Hampshire is, is very strong and, and gets uh, excellent results. This past legislative term, we, we turned to a, another school choice law. We enacted a scholarship tax credit program, and it was designed to increase educational options for uh, primary and secondary students and, and their families. And, and we purposely made it a modest program in order to see if we could get as much uh, support within the community, within the state, and within um, both parties. So we uh, put a an initial year credit cap on the program of $3.4 million. So the first year of the program would be implemented would be 2013. Um, the next year the cap would be $5.1 million. And year after year it could increase by 25% if there was 80% participation in the program. In other words, 80% of the scholarships um, were used. We also tried to give the, uh, the individual scope of the program uh, a limited characteristic. And so we said that the average uh, scholarship can be no more than $2,500, except for special education students where uh, we said it has to be at least $4,375. Um, and we also, in, in order to address some of the concerns that we heard, that this th program will just be used by present uh, students who are presently going to private schools, we said that in order to be eligible for the program, you had to be the prior year a homeschooled student or public school student, or have, once it's implemented, obviously this made sense, or have received the scholarship in, in the uh, private, uh, the prior year. And we also put a, a monetary, a family income limit on it. We said that students must come from households with a family income that's less than 300% of federal poverty level. In New Hampshire, that's around $69,000 for a family of four. Uh, and so that, that uh, nonetheless made about half of New Hampshire students eligible for it. The scholarships are, again, reflective of tax credits given to businesses against our two primary business tax programs, which is the business enterprise tax, which is a tax on payrolls, and the business profits tax. And, and the tax credits are given to a private organization in order to avoid a provision in the New Hampshire Constitution that we refer to as the Blaine Am Amendment that prohibits any public money going to sectarian schools. Um, we we, put, we all did put a limit on the amount of administrative costs that could be. There could only be 10% administrative costs uh, in the program. And, you know, despite our efforts to keep the program limited and to, uh, to uh, focus in on students who had um, limited educational opportunity, the opposition was substantial and sustained. Um, and unfortunately, at least in the opposition, it was mostly partisan. Out of the 236 votes in favor of the uh, program when it got to the House floor, we have a very large uh, House in, in New Hampshire, 400 members, um, 236 uh, votes in favor. There were only two Democrat votes um, in favor of it. Substantial, as it turned out, a number of Republican votes in opposition, but 236 uh, Democrat votes, uh, excuse me, two out of the 236 uh, votes were Democrats. In the Senate, there were no Democrat votes um, in favor of it. And our Democratic governor uh, vetoed it. We were able to override the veto this, this past um, summer, and uh, it will be implemented uh, starting uh, January 1st. Unfortunately, the uh, program became a main focus of the past election. And it wasn't a focus so much because it motivated voters. If you, you know, our surveys showed that voters were generally supportive of school choice, generally supportive of, of families with less financial opportunities having greater educational opportunities. But, but it was important to the base of the opposition um, in this campaign. And, and their objection to it was that they said it was too costly. 
In other words, it's too broad in scope, would take money out of uh, public education. They also would say in, in the same publications, it's too limited. It has no benefit. It's not going to help students. Uh, they said that it would damage public schools, um, assuming that any money that was taken out in tax credits would be, uh, have gone to public schools, and despite the fact that the first year implementation costs would be approximately one-tenth of one percent of uh, the total primary and secondary education funding uh, in New Hampshire on a yearly basis. And despite the fact we also put into uh, the bill a, a provision that would say as students come out of public schools, the money for those students, the state aid for those students, wouldn't immediately be removed from those schools. So in other words, spending would decline for our local schools at a faster rate than the revenues to those schools coming from the uh, state. They also uh, objected to it as, uh, because they said it had no uh, uh, accountability, even though the school, the money would have to be used for schools that um, have to be approved by the Department of Education. And finally, they said it's unconstitutional, um, basically taking the position that tax credit equals public money is therefore a violation um, of the Blaine Amendment. Now, I was hopeful when I came, put my marks uh, together initially to come here, that I could speak to you about the controllable risks involved in the implementation of this. And there, there certainly are some risks. You know, there's going to be a legal challenge on the basis of, uh, that I just discussed with you. Um, our assumption was that that would not be successful, both because of, of leg legal history on this issue, um, plus the fact that they, in order to object to the program, they had to wait for it to be implemented in order to get standing. And so you, they basically have to put themselves in a position of um, trying to take scholarships away from students, which was not, it wouldn't have been a very popular position to be in. More substantial challenges would have been regulatory challenges. Our Department of Education is very much focused to, um, as Governor Bush talked about it, the adults in education, to the, the trade union um, aspect of, of uh, our, our education community in, in New Hampshire. And we assumed that there would be a substantial amount of obstacles put in the way by state uh, officials. Um, an example of what they can do is this, uh, past year, uh, the Department of Education just blanket refused all charter school applications based upon a, a non-existent financial pro uh, problem. They basically said, well, we don't have a new budget, and if we approve this, we have to be assuming that the legislature in subsequent years will uh, fund uh, uh, these charter schools or provide the state funding. We don't fund them entirely, and therefore we're not going to approve any. So there, there is a substantial amount of inertia when it comes to the State Department of Education and, and allowing for, uh, organ, uh, for um, uh, opportunities in education. And then we thought that there'd just be the, implement, the classic implementation problems, getting the right uh, type of 501c3 organizations together, getting out there to parents, getting out there to uh, the business community, getting the program going. All these were controllable, solvable risks. Uh, unfortunately, all of those risks now are superseded by the fact that um, the program stands um, not only a good chance, but I would have to uh, suggest a likelihood of being repealed. Um, again, because it was a mainstay of the uh, campaign and in the, in the uh, legislature, the Democrats have taken back the House. Uh, and the, while the Senate remains Republican, uh, it is a 13 to 11 split, and of those 13, two are Republicans who voted against the program. Our assumption is that it's going to be uh, repealed. So, you know, it, it could be one of those instances where you took, we, we've taken two steps forward, maybe three steps back. But um, certainly, if we can avoid that, I think it's a well-structured program. Um, as we went about our campaign, as we talked to people about it, it's, it's well-supported. And, and uh, our hope is that we can keep it going. Thank you. Much, Speaker. Yeah. Uh, Jason, I think you have you have a PowerPoint that you want to uh, show. We need a little technical assistance up up here. We passed a law in 2010 called the Lindsay Nicole Henry Scholarship Program in Oklahoma, and it was modeled on the Florida law, the McKay Scholarship. So it functions very similar to that. So I won't spend a lot of time talking about it. 
But as you probably know, uh, school choice, and particularly vouchers, is, is near to a, a contact sport. And so from a coach's perspective, I've got some video to look at uh, to, uh, the other team to see what they're going to say. And I'll just tell my Oklahoma colleagues here, none of you made the clips. Uh, so don't, I don't want you to be nervous. I just want you to sit back and, and enjoy it. But I will say that when I go through these clips pretty quickly, um, because of my friends from Oklahoma that are here, you'll notice one party's dominant in these clips, but there was really very strong opposition from both parties, and one of the strongest opponents of the law was a, was a friend of mine, a fellow Republican that, that represents a uh, suburban school district that has continued to fight this law. So I'll just roll right into these clips, and I'll comment about each one of them uh, when, when it's finished. Well, wait, you're, when, when you're doing this, you're absolving a child's rights. Because is that parent, in every case, and I'm not saying in a lot of cases, the parent would not know what's best for their child. They may think they know what's best, but do they? So, we had some parents in the gallery. This was on the final debate in the House. Um, you, know, a, 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 you know, a pure moment of honesty here. I appreciated that. Um, <laughs> the, the, I always like to turn the question back around, though. It's, it's, well, what about the public school? Who says they know what's best always? Uh, one of the things you'll see is that I just always try to turn the argument back around on them. You say, well, who, parents may not know the best. I'm like, well, schools may not know the best. So what do we do, shut them down? Um, next. No, that's, sorry. It's bad for public education. Our responsibility when we represent the 35,000 people back home is to stand up for all of the public school system, not two or three children. Now this should be pretty obvious. One of the things they do all the time is they want to focus on the institution, and there's a lot of different ways. So this is, if you just always watch for it, that's almost always going to be what they're doing instead of an individual child. It's easy to talk about all the children. It's very hard to talk about each child and to tell a child that has special needs, I'm sorry, you're, you have to stay here to support our institution. We're not going to do what's best for you. The institution is, is supreme. Uh, and I just reject that. We're creating expectations. That always reminded me back in the days of Johnson of the Great Society. Everyone thought everything was going to be wonderful. All of a sudden, we're having this panacea here. One of the other things is about expectations. Uh, they don't want to raise them too high. That's, that's a threat to them. And the question is, who's, whose expectations should be uh, driving this? The parent's expectation or the institutional expectation for a group of children? To me, you know, children are created in God's image, and they each have uh, unique potential. And if you give them all you know, a one-size-fits-all education, uh, you're going to leave a lot on the table. Uh, for our future, which I think is, is crazy. I mean, even if you go to a school where every kid wears a uniform, hopefully they let them pick the size uniform that fits them. Let's, let's, uh, allow, uh, let's allow kids to pick their education. The shared responsibility of tax-supported and tax support for public education is not a selfish motive that only benefits one child. And when you allow a voucher program like this to be implemented, then you take three children out of one classroom that may have 15 in it, and you allow those three children to leave. And the children left behind have less money to run the same program. Okay. That, I mean, one, you see that they see it as selfish because you're willing to do what's best for one child and not what's best for all children. To me, that's not selfish. That's just common sense. Um, the other thing, this is an economies of scale argument that they use, and they'll say, well, you got 10 kids in the class, just like he did, and three leave. Well, when you're talking about special education in Oklahoma, we, each different kind of disability has a different weight. So it depends on which children you're talking about, uh, what that weight is and how much money could potentially leave. Um, but what they're really talking about is we want to cannibalize the funding uh, of this child to benefit these children. This child's future is not as important their potential as a human being is not as important as funding a system 
so we can do triage or whatever and, and support these kids. And to me, that's, that's immoral. Um, in Oklahoma, we have a law, and you may have this in your state, that if you have schools with declining enrollment, you can count your high enrollment year for up to two years in Oklahoma. So they're already covered on their uh, fixed costs to absorb those over time. So you might look at your, your law in your state. It's also fine, they kept telling us when we were trying to pass the bill, well, if you get your funding from somewhere else, we're fine with it. Well, that's a perverse incentive to, for them to not serve some kids, so then they hopefully leave. They have fewer kids, they get to keep all the money. Forget it. I mean, it was a deal killer for me. We didn't change it. Um, and it's also about getting stuck with certain kids they don't want to get stuck with. So members, I'd, I'd ask you to please vote against this. Let's do an interim study. <laughs> this, and I was a lobbyist before I was elected, just to prove you could get elected uh, after being a lobbyist, but this is the political equivalent of the pull my finger joke. Don't do it. Uh, it's a stupid thing. Know your stuff before you go in. Know what they're going to say. Know the game plan. Know your talking points. Know who your, your allies are. Know who your enemies are. Know what they're going to say before they say it. Have the answer ready. And by breaking it down, uh, as I have here, or whatever uh, the folks in your state are saying, um, will help you get there. And one last clip. But one thing you can do is you can say that you are totally against the Constitution of Oklahoma and the United States by diverting these funds for a private institution. Well, one, it's not against the United States Constitution. That's the courts have, have looked at that. Um, it could or could not be against our Blaine Amendment in Oklahoma. We have probably one of the most broadly written, written Blaine Amendments that is all encompassing. And I went back this last summer and reviewed verbatims from our Constitutional Convention uh, from 1907. And they had rejected specific provisions to make it education specific and left it completely broad. Uh, so it's, you know, what about all these other programs in Oklahoma? It's, it's no different in Oklahoma. All these things would apply if it's a religious hospital or uh, we have foster care services. I've started collecting information from other state agencies. We violate the Blaine Amendment to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars a year, I'm sure. So there's just several contrasts uh, between what I think is a common sense school choice approach and what opponents are going to say. Who knows best, public schools or parents? Who's right? to make a bad decision should trump. The parents, let's make a good decision, everybody's gonna be for that, but, but sometimes bad decisions are gonna be made that, aren't, that don't work out. Who should, when push comes to shove, whose decision should trump? I think it should be the parents. Um, what's more important, institutions or individuals? Uh, it's interesting that they're worried about all the children in public, they're responsible for all the children in public school like this is one giant child that they're worried about but they get real worried about this specific child the moment they get a voucher to go to a private school. It's interesting, and it's another thing I like to point out to them. It's like, well, now, why don't you be that concerned about this child when they're in, in the public school? They wouldn't be leaving. One of the things, and that, that one clip of the, the lady talking that looked kind of fuzzy, she is one of the superintendents uh, that I'll talk about in a second, but I mean, they never asked the question after the law passed when the school district started throwing a fit why do any of these kids want to leave? It never dawned on them to ask that question, which is different than in Florida, I guess, where it actually caused the schools to get better. In Oklahoma, they just thought you're an idiot for wanting to leave. <laughs> this is just a brief, the law's been in effect since 2010. It went in in August 2010. This is one of the, the mothers of a child. It's just little things to other people, but they're major things in our life. She has friends that disagree, think public school funds should uh, remain in public schools. I might have been the same way, she said, if circumstances were different. Well, it turns out that Nancy here uh, is in one of the two school districts in Oklahoma where the schools are suing the parents uh, for using the scholarship program. We had school districts retaliate. Our, our, our State Department of Education has been very supportive, uh, and so we haven't had the problems that were mentioned earlier, but in 2010, the program began August, in August. The parents were transferring the kids the school districts in eight or seven school districts waited until two months after that and then voted in open school board meetings to not follow the law. So you basically strand the parents uh, in, the, in, the, in the private school with no way to pay for the tuition. We had a new attorney general elected in 2011. Um, he threatened the school boards. They reversed course. They came uh, on board but then said they were going to sue the attorney general, which they never did. Uh, 
then later on, two school districts end up suing the parents, not the AG. Uh, March of this year, a district court said the law was unconstitutional, uh, but just last week, last Tuesday, uh, the Oklahoma Supreme Court said that the school districts lack standing, kicked out the, the lawsuit, so the program is continuing. So that's where we stand. I know I've gone over my time, so thank you. Time for questions from the audience. Who would like to go first? Yes, sir. Doesn't it make sense to have a level playing field strategy so that parents can choose public schools, charter schools, religious schools, whatever makes sense for their, for their kids? Go ahead. Um, I have a, a little bit different perspective. As I mentioned in my remarks, the city of New Orleans is almost entirely charter schools. And it has been for five, six years now. Um, a couple of points about that. Number one, the trend line, the growth of uh, educational outcomes for the students of Orleans Parish, New Orleans, are, is tremendous. The curve is just straight up off the chart uh, compared to where they were because they were flat down at the bottom. That's the good news. The bad news is, and, and maybe it's not bad news, maybe it's a concern, uh, each charter school has its own little board. And we have dozens and dozens of them now. And, and there's a growing concern that as these schools age, the boards term out, the, the members of the boards term out, and you get new board members. And perhaps the quality and the strength of the board could decline over time. Then what happens to the charter school? Because there's no other structure to support it. It's supported by its own board. So I think one of the, one of the potential pitfalls we all face in a broad charter program is the lack of structure behind each individual school. And we're going to have to be very careful how we go forward with this because if those individual boards that govern those individual charter schools do not remain strong, very strong, then we're going to see quality suffer and we're going to see outcomes decline and it could be precipitous because there's nothing to back them up. In Orleans Parish, if the charter schools start to go down, and they aren't, they're doing great, but if they do start to go down, I mean, the, the, the decline would be precipitous because there's no structure in place uh, to, to back up the charter schools. And so that's my only concern. Sure. I'm Cameron Smith with the Alabama Policy Institute. Um, Delegate Howe, maybe you can comment on this, and really any of y'all. I mean, in Alabama, one of the issues that we have is an incentive problem. Um, for example, the majority affluent schools that are in the public school system do well, provide solid education to the students, and they see reform as threatening their model that actually works and produces solid educational results for the students. On the other hand, um, some of the schools are in and around Birmingham, for example, the reforms are seen as heavily negative, the teachers unions are able to basically create a block vote against any sort of reforms. And so you had mentioned the brainwashing. How do you overcome that narrative? How, how do you change school choice and these educational reforms across the board into a narrative that says, hey, this is good for you where you are, this is good for the individual because you know, that's, a, that's a tough thing that we face in Alabama and I'd like to hear y'all's thoughts. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned uh, school choice uh, because when that question was asked to me many months, years ago, uh, I've always supported school choice. I supported school choice when school choice didn't support me. When they bust me 20 miles past one school to get to another one, I supported school choice then. <laughs> so it's obvious that I support it now. Uh, I think when, when, you, when you look at our public uh, edu schools, education system in America, uh, I believe these statistics are right, uh, correct. 25% uh, of our students that graduate from high school now, public school, uh, cannot pass the armed forces exam, uh, which tells me that something is broken and it needs to be fixed. So if if choice, school choice, and I think this, uh, this can help, but we have to do something. We have to look at this seriously, as Governor Bush said this morning. We cannot continue uh, down the road that we're headed down now. It's failing. It's no doubt in my mind that, to a large degree, the public schools 
Many of them are broken. I'll give you a good example. Uh, I represent part of Norfolk and part of Virginia Beach. Those of you who are familiar with Norfolk and Virginia Beach, uh, in Norfolk, 67% uh, of the students there are, are black. Uh, the schools in Norfolk, for the most part, are failing. Now, when you look at Virginia Beach, Chesapeake, and Suffolk, the other surrounding cities, this is not the case. So if that's true, and it is true that they're failing, something needs to happen in the city. Uh, if it's a charter school now, when I was on the school board in Norfolk uh, some years ago, they are adamantly opposed to charter schools. But when you have 67% uh, of your students that are in need, in my view, of special help, you have to do something to change what you're doing in that public school system. Uh, it cannot be business as usual. We have to make some changes. And if it means uh, more private schools, then let's go that way. The same thing with charter schools. Build a charter school, put a headmaster, whatever you call them, in there that has good ideas and that individual is able to hire his or her staff, the people that he, they want to work. That's the only way you can do it. But with the way the system is set up now, you can be a poor performing teacher and still remain in your job. I go back 45 years ago, the teacher that was teaching across the hall from me, I won't call his name, both of us were teaching history, but all he did day after day was stand there at the podium and read notes. That's all he did. I, I'm sure I didn't answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Pell, you, you actually had more Democrats vote for your initial bill than any other state upon the first passage of a, of a program. How did you do that in Louisiana? Uh, we brought in civic groups, uh, education groups, um, members from both sides of the aisle and members of the unions. And we sat around the table and we hashed out the ideas and we worked very hard on this. And we got a lot of uh, parents, especially minority parents, just as someone else was talking about, uh, to come uh, and testify in favor of the legislation and the bills uh, to state, the, you know, to state the case, to build the case for the importance of education for their kids. Just as, it's just as important as for uh, majority children and yet they were like silent prior to that. So they were able to come and became the face of reform uh, for Louisiana and I think that had more to do with anything else. If I could add my two cents, um, I think it takes, it's, first of all, it's very hard. Um, and I remember when we were trying to pass a tax credit bill initially in Florida, a very kind uh, black Democrat took me into his office, closed the door and said, John, look, I know you're right. This is the right thing to do but I can't vote for it. And I said, well, if it's right, why, why won't you vote for it? And he said, look, I came here to do 10 good things. This could be one of them, but if I did this one good thing, in my next election next year, the teachers union will take me out. So I can't do the other nine. And I said to myself, well, that's a very rational, reasonable position. So what we had to do was make it okay for him to do the right thing. And we did that in two ways. As I mentioned earlier, we organized parents, as you just mentioned. We also got ministers who are power brokers to make sure that they, were con they contacted these legislators and said, we are watching. We even ran radio ads with these ministers urging legislators to vote for, for these bills. But then the other thing we had to do was we had to help them in their campaigns. And so we raised money for them for direct contributions to their campaigns. And then we, as an independent expenditure committee, we spent in their races for them, significant amounts. And we had a few test cases where we won. That word spread very quickly, and then it started to snowball. So it's not easy, but it can be done. Next question. I'm State Senator Jane Cunningham from Missouri, and I have a question for Louisiana. You said that your Department of Education approved the private schools that could be choice schools, and I wonder if the legislature set definitive criteria, because typically departments of education will, be, uh, will discriminate against private schools. So maybe all accredited ones, all that graduate a certain number, or all that go to college, some criteria like that. That's first part of the question. Second part is you said that you used all state money 
for the vouchers. If you have a lot of local uh, local participation in the taxes. In other words, in our state, some districts get a lot of state money, others are more local money. How do you deal with that divergence? As to the first part of your question, we pretty much deferred to the Department of Education. We spelled out that we wanted specific guidelines, and they have to come back to the legislative committees for review periodically, but we did defer to them for uh, specific criteria and it is seemingly uh, working quite well. We had a little hiccup at the very beginning. Uh, one of the problems we experienced was that, and I had mentioned this briefly uh, in my earlier remarks, uh, in the pilot program in New Orleans uh, over the last few years, uh, some of the kids were actually going to schools and coming out with worse results, private parochial schools actually. We have, we have a very distinct uh, separation in Louisiana, private, parochial, and public. Uh, they were going to some parochial schools and their results were worse than the public schools from whence they came. Uh, we fixed that. We have now have an accountability system through the department, you know, defined by the Department of Education in place to ensure that the children are going to schools that are at least as, w as good or better than the public schools from which they come. Uh, the second part is uh, a very interesting problem that we have. We also have a bifurcation of funding, local and state. Our state is called a minimum foundation program. Uh, it represents about, as I pointed out, $8,300 per uh, district on average, and there's additional funds up to, I think the average in Louisiana we're spending is around twelve to 13000 local and state. Um, by definition, uh, we had to we have to do that. We had to do this very carefully because we have a uh, an article in our constitution that says the MFP program shall be for public education, and so we were very careful in defining uh, that the the money follows the child and it is for public education. They are public school students. They are enrolled in a public school, but they're given a voucher to attend a private school or a parochial school. And that's how we've gotten around it. Now, we did have a, um, uh, the first, there are two challenges uh, ongoing to our package of bills. Uh, one was brought in a federal court, uh, and the ruling came down yesterday. Uh, the, the challenge was on the basis of the, the parish, the district, uh, was under a 50-year-old desegregation order. Uh, the judge ruled that um, the shifting of funds that potentially could have gone to the school district uh, was in violation of the desegregation order. I, how it came up with that, I have no idea. Uh, it will be appealed. Uh, the other case will actually be heard tomorrow in state court, and it's a challenge on the basis of our, fed, our state constitution, that clause about the MFP, um, and we'll have to wait and see where that comes out. But under the law that we passed, the statute, uh, we did it that way. We very clearly defined that these are public school students and this are public funds going, state funds, going to public school students. Okay. We have time for one more question. <coughs> Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, uh, Representative Mike Glanton, uh, Georgia House of Representatives. And my question, too, is directed toward the Senator uh, in regards to uh, comments in regards to the concern of the decline of the quality that you may have on these various governance boards as we begin to move and transition. Uh, I'm uh, actually one of the founding members of, of a charter school in Georgia that is outpacing uh, most of the state right now. But the, the, what we have is we have the ability to appoint members. So rather than elected members coming in who are maybe not qualified, we have the ability to go out and get the best and the brightest in the community to serve on these boards. Mm -hmm. And if they don't work out, we have the ability to vote them off. And so with that being said, what would you suggest other than the before mentioned that we can do to make sure that we don't have a decline in the quality of the members serving on the boards? We don't have elected uh, members of charter school boards. Um, I think some, something that we're discussing uh, is the potential of setting up criteria, maybe it's what you do already, uh, whereby uh, members of these boards, some may have to have a business background, some may have to have a legal background, some an educational background, or something along those lines. What we don't want to see is, um, and, and I don't want this to be taken the wrong way, but it's true, um, is that it becomes just a nice thing to do and it's very, you know, civic-minded folks jump on there and we lose that passion 
in those skill sets and the ability to raise funds and the ability to bring technical skills to the table. Um, I, I've served on a lot of boards in my long term, in my long life, and uh, I've seen it happen uh, many, many times where it, it, the quality of the people on the boards, they, their passion may be high and they may be doing it for all the right reasons, but they just don't bring the right skills to the table or the right history to the table, and then the whole organization declines. That's my concern, because we have a system, at least in one place in the city of New Orleans, where it's all charter schools. So if that worst case scenario were to come to fruition, we could have a real problem. That, that's what my concern is. Join me in giving our panelists a round of applause.